I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast. Rob, today is the first part of a several part series that we're doing called, uh, did we actually come up with a name for it? I think we could, I think we're calling it Not Made in China. Not Made in China, Chinese Literature from Outside of, of China. Chinese um, Literature and Literature About China. Yeah, that's right. We've got uh, we've got that couple French of things form. going. Yeah, yeah. Um, so today we're looking at what are we looking at, Rob? It's kind of your call, so I'll let you go with that. But we're looking at a a poem from Vietnam, written in Chinese, uh, but from Vietnam. Uh, the name of the poet. And but hang gonna, on, Rob. Yo, you don't you don't speak Vietnamese. I don't. I really I, don't. Do you? I only I only took a semester's worth of Vietnamese. I didn't even so know I'm, you took a semester. Why did you take a semester of Vietnamese? Because Vietnam's a pretty cool country. And That's I true. I agree. I just didn't know if you had any more pressing reason. I didn't know that. Mm, yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, even though this is written in Vietnam, it is written in Chinese, in classical Chinese, actually. Right. And of course, that's for good reason, since classical Chinese was sort of the lingua franca of scholarship in much of Asia for a long time, a little bit like Latin or thousand Greek years in yeah. other parts of the world. Yeah, um, and the the author that we're going to be looking at today, why don't we just use her Chinese name? Yep. Uh, it's Hu Chunxiang, uh, hmm. who was in uh, the same last name that Hu Jintao, the previous uh, chairman of the Communist Party, had. And then Chun is just spring and Xiang is smell hmm. or fragrance. Nice name. So, yeah. And uh, obviously a girl's name uh, in terms of uh, the, the, I don't think this could be a guy's name ever. Um, she is a Vietnamese woman, a fairly elite woman writing in the early 19th century in Vietnam. Mm-hmm. And we don't actually have that much information about her other than that she is one of the great Vietnamese poets and that she is a female, which is a bit unusual both in Chinese society and especially even more outside of China. You know, women just weren't educated in uh, classical Chinese that much. It's it's. It's, you know, it's even, that's true in China, but that's even more true outside of uh, the Chinese speaking world. If you think about kind of the comparison with Latin, you know, it's not really that hard to learn Latin if you speak Italian, because Italian is just bad Latin two millennia on, right? Yeah, yeah. But, but when you go over to German or when you go to English, it's quite difficult to jump to Latin because it's not a, a, a romantic language. Right. Romance language. Romance. Romantic. But it just could be a romantic language depending on how you use it. I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> not anymore. I think if you used it now, it wouldn't be romantic. If you used that on a date, not you, obviously, the you, sort of the general you, wouldn't work. Oh, no. If I used it on a date, it would definitely be romantic. Rob, remember that time you and I were on a date? Let's just, and- let's just not talk about that. That's, that's for the... <laughs> <laughs> what happens on the podcast stays on the podcast. Speaking, um, speaking of romance, the, yes. the poem is titled On Being a Concubine. Mm. And it's not very romantic. It's not very romantic. Uh, it's not a particularly long poem. Do uh, you want to just read your translation of it real quick? Yeah, and we'll be posting this translation on the website. Uh, so if you want to check it out, please do. Here we go. Uh, on Being a Concubine by... Uh, Hu Chunxiang. One is covered by a quilt, another suffers from the cold. Sharing a husband, what a danged fate. Five times, ten times with him, I hope to share his bed, but I am not even clear if I will have this once a month. I force myself to swallow the rice, but the rice is stinky. I do work, and the work is unpaid. If I had before known that being a concubine was this disrespected, I would have rather been as before and just stayed unmarried. So wow. that's, it, it's, it's rough. Um, but this is not a, a, a unique thing. There's, there's a long fascination with the life of the, the courtesan, 
or the concubine, they figure pretty large in tons of Chinese stories and poems. There's a whole subgenre of vernacular Chinese fiction dedicated to this, and I can't imagine Vietnamese literary society being that different. Um, this is a this is an interesting poem, partly you know that it's as with any translation of a classical Chinese poem, poem written in a classical style. It feels a little uh, unremarkable, like this. This could read like a simple essay or or part of a prose poem, right? Um, but the poem in Chinese is very very different because you've got that structure, very very firm structure. In fact, you and I were talking about this right before the podcast. Depending on how you separate the lines, it reads like either a Lu Shi or a Jue Ju style Tang Dynasty poem. And Rob, um, you're yeah. you're more of the expert on Tang Dynasty prosody. So could you explain just basically for for the listener what the difference between those two are? So the Jue Ju is effectively two quatrains, two lines of four with seven characters each. And a Lu Shi is eight lines. But those lines can be, I mean, they all have fixed characters in each line, but it can be five, six, or seven. So I, you and I sort of thought this was a juju, which is two quatrains, because the the subject matter, the rhyme scheme, all that sort of cuts off at line four. So that makes sense. Now, mm-hmm. regardless of, of where you put the stress, though, it's interesting reading such a, well, for lack of a better phrase, Chinese style in a region that's not Chinese. I mean, I guess that's not surprising given that that's the, that's the training anyone from an intellectual class in Asia would have had for a while. Uh, but I'm coming at this brand new, so it feels a little strange. Yeah, um, I, I, just to remind you, Rob, and the listener, uh, Chinese was actually the language of education in Vietnam until pretty much 1919. The French colonized the region in the 1860s, I believe, but they uh, largely left intact the intellectual tradition of, of, you know, educating elites in Chinese until they start started to feel threatened by the nationalism bubbling up in China in 1919. So in some ways, the May 4th movement kind of sparked a revolution both in China and in Vietnam, but in Vietnam, it, it just lit a fire under under the French, and they decided to educate everyone in in French. This was kind of a positive and a negative uh, because it actually meant that, unlike before 1919, the French took real colonial responsibility um, for for educating the Vietnamese population. Um, the French had previously, even before they had colonized Vietnam. Uh, there had been a, a, a French Catholic missionary who had proposed and uh, who had proposed a system of writing Vietnamese with an alphabetical script, because Vietnamese at the time did not have a script. Uh, before before this proposal, Vietnamese was written in Chinese, which is is kind of crazy if you think about it even right. japanese you know had several different scripts that it was working with korean right. of course has has the 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 script that they use today it was less used but it was invented i believe in the 1600s but vietnamese i i don't think actually had a native script that they invented they just used chinese yeah uh, and that's a bit strange, and it's very clunky to use. It's clunky to use Chinese characters any at any time, even in a Chinese language like Mandarin or Cantonese. But when you take Chinese characters out of Chinese, it actually gets even clunkier. And so it's it's really fascinating that 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 situation lasted really until 1919. Well, and that's one of the interesting questions whenever we get into issues of colonialism in Asia, Um, because China usually is described as semi-colonial, but they were themselves colonizers. So the the question, you know, on the surface, when you say something like, and then the French educated them in the French, you know, way, my gut instinct is to think, what a bunch of, oh, it sucks that you would do. But on the other hand, 
they weren't using their own language anyway. Mm -hmm. So one colonial language effectively replaced another colonial language. Um, and that's a weird dynamic. Like critiquing that is peculiar because on the one hand, this is the, the Chinese is what they'd been using for years. So maybe they should have left it alone. But on the other hand, that was never really the language in the first place. Yeah, Rom, so you say that's a weird dynamic, but I actually don't think so. And I think it's interesting to think about this poem in terms of coloniality. I think mm. we'll get to that in a second. But you you said that to go from one, to hop from one colonial language or one colonial script to another colonial script, it's it's actually not that that strange. Um, you know, think about China at this time in the early 1800s. It's facing colonial predation by Western powers, but simultaneously, it is actually a colonial power itself in in Xinjiang. Xinjiang, of course, it literally this is the 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 far northwestern part of of the PRC today. But Xinjiang, literally, the name literally means new territory. And I'll have Chinese friends tell me, you know, Xinjiang has been an intrinsic part of China for, you know, billions and billions of years. Uh, and I'm just kind of like, wait a second, why is it called new new territory? And, and they'll kind of like drop their mouth and not have anything to say. The reason is, is because China colonized Xinjiang uh, in the 1760s, I believe. Uh, and and so China is a colonial power at the same time it's being colonized. That's not actually that different from Vietnam. Vietnam, Saigon, actually was founded by the Cham people, a people who are have largely been wiped out. The second group of people to kind of come into into Saigon was not the Vietnamese; it was the Chinese. So the the Cham, the Chinese then the Vietnamese, then the French, all kind of came into Saigon to make Saigon this important city. But it's not, it's important to remember that Saigon, just as it was getting started, was barely Vietnamese because Vietnam at the time, when it was being colonized by France, was just colonizing much of what we today call, quote unquote, I'm using scare quotes in case you can't see me, uh, Vietnam, right? Like, this is this is not this is not an unusual situation. Most powers that are colonized by Western colonialists are themselves colonizing powers. Right. It's 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 in this region is in particular it's very slippery. Um, but as someone coming at this not as a historian but as someone just reading a poem, it for me anyway it's a little tricky to know where to place it. Uh, particularly because if you just given me this poem and you hadn't said. This is written by a Vietnamese writer in the 19th century. I would assume it was a Tang Dynasty poem written by a Chinese poet. Hmm. Um, because that it's it's a very well written. Well, it's not an amazing poem, but it's not bad. I think it's pretty good. It's not bad. It's it, I, it feels a little clunky to me in places, but then maybe that's just me. Maybe I'm not sophisticated enough. Um, maybe you're just too sophisticated. Maybe that's it. That's probably it. I'm too so sophisticated. sophisticated. Yeah. You you could stop any time now. That'd be great. But no, but I mean, it reads, it's it's textbook, uh, either, well, I think we agreed to it, it's, it's a textbook fixed Chinese form. There aren't any cues, that the, the, the poet doesn't say, oh, the other day when I was walking down the streets of Saigon to give you some sort of cue to, oh, this is not in China. I would have read this, there are concubines in China, there are complaints by concubines in China. There are stories detailing those complaints. Like it's it's an old style as well. I, hmm. There's nothing about this that strikes me as quote unquote Vietnamese, but yeah. then again, it doesn't have to, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, it, it's important to point out that national ideas of nationality probably weren't that developed at this time. So, so uh, uh, Hu Chunxiang, might not have thought of herself in terms of a national identity. Uh, but yeah, I agree with you 100%. You know, there's nothing, if I were to read this and not know the context, there's nothing to indicate that this is not something that's being written by a Chinese woman in the Tang Dynasty. Well, and you mentioned questions of nationality because it was the same thing in Europe. It's not like there was a hue and cry over the universalization of Latin for centuries. And then suddenly the authorities were like, all right, fine, we'll, we'll give you your own language back. 
that was just the way things were. It was a it was a new idea, you know, someone like Dante choosing to not write in Latin and write in Italian was not a middle finger to the establishment. It was it was an artistic gesture of what I want to say can be said better this way. That the, the, the vehicle that Latin has been is no longer sufficient. Um, so reading a poem like this in reverse, in retrospect, you can put it in sort of a colonial history, but be, having been written in, in the language it was then was – this was just the lingua franca. This is if you were going to write a poem, this is how you wrote it. You didn't write sure. a poem in the the native language because that's not literature. Yeah. Literature equals this language. Yeah, uh, we should we should make this clear. You know, Rob and I, neither of us are experts on Vietnamese literature, but it is no our under, <laughs> it is our understanding that you know if you were if you were elite enough to be writing poetry, you probably weren't writing in Vietnamese. In fact. I'm not clear on whether or not there were that many people actually writing in Vietnamese. Now, obviously, lots of people were speaking Vietnamese at the time or, you know, an earlier form of Vietnamese. But but whether or not Vietnamese was ever written down at this time, I don't e- even in 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 uh, Chinese characters using Chinese characters. I, I, I think it was it was fairly uncommon, much more likely uh, would be that educated elites would be writing in literary Chinese. That is when you win. Right. And, you know, we, we can, we can kind of, this is, this is one of the thoughts I'm going to close with. Um, the it, questions of context and history are important and interesting, but ultimately when we read a work like this, you ask yourself, how do I, how does this read? Even apart from the historical context, is this, at least in my reading a well-structured poem, and do I enjoy it? There's, there's lots of simple questions we can ask. And as a poem, it's quite beautiful. It's quite well-written. I, I mentioned clunky. I don't mean it's a bad poem, but you know, we've, I've been doing a lot this, this term in my online course with Chinese poetry. And we started with Dufu compared to Dufu. <laughs> it's a clunky poem, but then so is like 98% of the rest of the tradition in China. Um, Shakespeare's clunky compared to Dufu, frankly. Wow. I think I'd have to agree with you, but anyway, um, <laughs> that's that's sort of that just shows our bias. But um, but you know that's not to say it's it's a very nice poem. It's a very well written poem, and there's some interesting little details. The fact that in the fifth and sixth line, you have the same. You have a homonym, Cho and Cho, mm. and they even mean they, they don't mean the same thing. One means basically stinky. The other means like uh, recompense, reward, reward. recompense. Yeah. But it's an interesting choice, right? Cho and Cho. Why not? There's different ways to put that. Why and if you use the same sound? And if you look actually line uh, five and six also, you've got a repetition of the word fan, that is rice in line five, and a repetition of the word gong in right. line six, and they're in the exact same spot. That's really, right. that's a, quite a, a poetic achievement in terms right. of prosody. Right. So this is not just someone who writes in Chinese, but this is someone who writes very, very well yeah. in Chinese. And you have to assume she grew up speaking Vietnamese because I don't believe this was the vernacular lingua franc. I just think it was like the version of Latin where that's what you wrote in. So she had a fairly solid mastery of not just the poetic tradition, but the literary language, which is impressive. Yeah, to be fair, I don't think that literary Chinese was the vernacular for anybody because right, it's true. sort of a you know, an invented language I right, mean, to right. a certain degree. Right. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you before we closed out, so we've talked a lot about ideas of colonialism and coloniality in this, in this discussion. And we have a female author, a female poet here talking about the abuse that she receives as a concubine. We don't know that much about her life, um, but I was wondering, do you think we can read this at a, like, can we read this poem as a colonial message? Can we actually read this in terms of colonialism and nationality? And let me explain my interpretation. You've got a woman here who has a husband, but he has multiple wives, and she, the the wife or the, the concubine, feels disrespected. She feels like she's not getting her fair share when she should. Can we interpret that as the relationship as a metaphor for the relationship between China and Vietnam. 
I don't know. I, I think if you want to read it that way, you probably can't. Like I say before, I don't see any cues here that make me go, oh, wow, interesting. Especially because the last line in your translation says, I would have rather been as before and just stayed unmarried, which suggests a level of choice that I don't think exists in a, in a colonial perspective. You don't say, you know, maybe it would have been better if we hadn't been a colony, right? That's not, it's not really a choice. But that's the interesting thing about the relationship between Vietnam and China is it does seem to be a, a, a chosen kind of colonialism, right? Like it's, it, I mean, certainly China at various points in, in history, particularly I'm thinking of the Han Dynasty and the Ming Dynasty, uh, it did impose colonialism, like a, a straightforward just colonialism on, on the areas that we today know as Part of Vietnam, but to a certain degree, I mean, she's writing several centuries after any Chinese army has ever tried to invade Vietnam. So the the fact that Vietnam is still largely in hock to literary Chinese as a language of education suggests a kind of coloniality that's chosen. Of course, the the breakdown in that argument is if you. I would have rather been as before suggests a before, which means she has to have been able to write literary works in Vietnamese and have chosen to switch to Chinese for that argument to make sense. Because here in the poem, there's a before, uh, which I can't think of any, I mean, I have no real historical knowledge of the period, but if this works the way you have mentioned it, then there haven't been any intellectuals who wrote in Vietnamese, like wrote Vietnamese poetry in Vietnamese before this. So there's not really a before. Yeah, I mean, I think you're being a little nitpicky there. I don't uh, think so. <laughs> you're 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 sort of reading the 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 fact that she's a concubine and chose to be a concubine, but where's the before? And I I I think that that the sort of colonial interpretation is a bit of a stretch, but I think it's still a valid interpretation. I think, and, and you know, I, sh I should mention, and this is going to be my last thing because we're starting to stretch this out a little bit, but my, my last thought on this is, uh, you know, we, it would be interesting to set this in context with A, all of her other works, and B, contemporary works. Because that's mm -hmm. really where you start seeing allegorical elements like, ah, the fact that, say, every time they talk about a concubine, it's in this way, you know, that, yeah. that's the kind of thing that gives you a cue. Uh, sure. But for, just for my own purposes, I just appreciate this as a poem. It's, it's a very, very beautiful poem. Yeah. Um, so we'll put the translation and the original Wen Yin Wen on the website. Uh, go take a look at it and keep on the lookout. We'll be posting some more Not Made in China Chinese Literature podcast from this series. Sounds good. Uh, I'm Lee Moore. I'm Rob Moore. And this is the Chinese Literature Podcast.